Welcome back to the class. This is week four of the class. We are going to start to write more code to get a real project coming together. You have the assignment that is due tomorrow where you are setting up the project. And so looking briefly at the uh, module this week, so on the syllabus, I've got listed there coding, basic, then intermediate, then advanced. So this would be the basic starting week. And what I talk about in here is a very scary message where I, where I remind you, coding is hard. You don't have to suffer. You are here in a class with people to help you, me or the, or the assistants or even your classmates. Code is annoying because you have to be perfect at it. It is not like other things, especially art, where if you do something close enough, it will be good. Code has to be perfect in order for it to work because computers are dumb. Unless you program them right, they don't do what you want. Um, so definitely get help if you need it. Those of you that are at home, it's a little bit harder to help you because obviously, you have to be on Zoom, we have to do a screen share, and then you can get help that way. If you're here in person, we'll just go over your shoulder, look at your code and, and fix it. And especially if you need help outside of Monday or Wednesday, it's gonna be a little harder in that you have to set up time with myself, most likely the assistants, set up time with them at a reasonable time, not at midnight when you're doing your best work, but at a reasonable nine to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. So the assistants are there to help, but they're not your personal assistants. So be sure that at a reasonable time, you contact them to set up some one-on-one -on -one time. That's why we've got the assignments always due on a Tuesday so that you have the Monday lab, the Wednesday lab, one more Monday lab, and then the assignment is due on a Tuesday. So make sure you ask for help at a reasonable time and not when the assignment is due in an hour, definitely some time in advance. Or come to the labs in person, Mondays and Wednesdays, 2.30 to 3 p.m. to get that help. That's noted on the welcome message. That's noted on the announcement. That is me saying it and recording it. Therefore, I will not give sympathy when people need help at the last minute because you know you should know this if you're here live or if you're replaying this. And again, if you didn't replay it, I note it in several places. So late homework on account of I needed help and I didn't get it in time is not going to be a good excuse. And that will affect your grade. So big capital letters, please do not wait until it's too late to ask for help. Obviously, you'll get as much possibility for help, such as our starting point is going to be a file that is ready we're just going to start to learn the code. And every week on the live session, I will upload a copy of my finished project here as a, um, as a place for you to double check your code. You'll be able to play the recording, replay it, and see my actual code. Because moving forward, I noted somewhere else here as well, you're going to learn the ingredients to make the project, the 500 lines of code. But then as we go little by little throughout the rest of the semester, the ingredients that you learn, it's to the projects you're working on. You know, I've got so far, I've got four that have been turned in. It's due tomorrow, but I've got four that have been turned in of all of you or some of you that you've got your, this is my starting project based on the work, uh, the flow chart, based on the model sheet, based on everything you've learned. Now you've got your idea where it's your character going through a maze, your character in the Antarctic, uh, your character fleeing the laboratory. You've got your idea. Together, we're gonna learn using this starting file that I have for you in the week four, um, in the week four courses. So it, it's what I want people to do is with my file, get my file from week four, we're gonna start from there. Once you learn that, then you're gonna apply it 
to your own project file. Again, if that sounds confusing, lab time, help time, message me. It should not be confusing, especially if you ask for help. And so this particular week, notice there's no homework. Next week, there will be a homework where I'm gonna check your file, that it is up to the point of what we've learned in class. This week and next week, we're gonna learn code, and then you're gonna apply those codes to your file. Um, and that'll be a, a homework next week. And then in two weeks after that, another code check-in, and then by then the semester is about to end, and then the final project. We had an assignment every week so far, we're going to take a break on assignments, but you should be still on track with what we're learning and asking for help. So that's the preview of things there. What you want to do right now then is you want to make sure you've got the um, starting file if you want to follow along. Uh, I've got you should open up the starting file, save it with your name or save as however you want. We need to do a bit of setup and then we'll start to code. Again, these computers, every time they uh, get restarted, they forget uh, about that air SDK. So you have to do it every time. And they also probably will forget the Adobe Air setup. So let's do that and then we can proceed. The starting file that I'm giving you here has a title scene, a help scene, and a few scenes. There's nothing on the screens but there's a code layer, there's a background layer, there's a few scenes. Before we do anything, let's go up to the file menu, Air, Android settings. Let's go to that Android settings there, Air, Android settings on the file menu. And same as before, we'll go through these four little panels here briefly. Uh, language, set any language you want. Permissions, activate internet. Icons, skip it for a moment. General, the only thing really to change here is the aspect ratio. Remember, we're in landscape mode. Nothing else to change here. Don't worry about anything else, but aspect ratio landscape. On general, on language, pick anyone, English, permissions, pick anyone, internet. And then deployment. Uh, this is the one where you'll have to do the create one more time. Or if you have your file from previously, you can go to browse, put your password, and then click OK. If you don't have your file from last time, I'll do the create. Fill it out one more time, however you want. Type your password, remember. If you're going to use a device, you can turn on the install on a connected device. Wait for it to synchronize or detect it, that is. Then launch it and pick your device there and just click OK. So we will have to do this setup most of the time when we come in. We'll, we'll set up the Air SDK. We'll fill in these settings the same way over and over. And then we'll be ready to start. OK, so. I showed the example previously of that haunted house. We're gonna create an example of it together. You're gonna to learn the ingredients, pressing a button to move to a screen, picking an object up to use it on the door, um, having a time limit of a boss, uh, having random keys appearing on screen and you know all of these things, health, health counter, hit points, experience, whatever. We're gonna learn all of these things on this one generic starting point file. And then the things that we learn in class, you're going to apply them onto your assignment that you're going to be working on in the future weeks. I've got in my case here, my various scenes. Notice how I named them. You can name your scenes however you want. Here's how I'm naming them SC, which means C. 
scene of title, scene of help, scene of main one. I'm gonna we're gonna change these in a moment. Scene of main one, scene of main two, scene of end, good, scene of end, bad. Again, you can call these whatever you want, but you want to keep it no spaces. You can use upper cases like I have there if you want. No spaces. And just for the very, you know, computers are dumb nature of it all, notice how most people would have called this good ending or bad ending, like real, you know, grammar. But because computers are dumb, here's computer grammar. This is a scene that relates to an ending, specifically the good ending. This is a scene that relates to, the, to an ending, specifically the bad ending. This is a scene that relates to the help screen. So the logic of that is that this prefix notes that it's a scene, because when you're looking through your hundreds of lines of code and things can be named anything, if I type something that is SC something, that tells me, oh, this is related to a scene. This is related to moving to the different scenes or something. It's scene related. So I've got the prefix SC for scene. I can have 20 endings. Did you get all the crystals or only seven of them? Well, those are all related to endings. So scene ending. And I've got, just to keep it simple, good ending, bad ending. I could have scene end 100%, scene end 25%. And the logic of that is computers are dumb. So I'm naming these things in a very simple way. The best. It's however you wish, but following along with the instructor and with the class might be a good idea. On this very first screen here, here's where we can have a little bit of a little bit of artistry on that background scene. You can unlock it. And um we're going to write the title of the project, any sort of artwork that you want. And then we're going to set up two buttons in a moment. One button will go to help, and one button will go to start. So briefly here, um, I'm just going to write the name of the project, which is Haunted House. This, of course, can be animated. Letters animate each one at a time and all that good stuff. but. We're gonna sort of work with the um, basics, the skeleton of things, and then we're gonna add to the skeleton as time goes on. We wanna make sure the basic things work, and then we can make the better things. Like, I want first the cool animation to happen. I want thunder and lightning. Then I want haunted house. We can do that later. I want the basic things to work first. This is the haunted house project. Two buttons. I'm going to be very simple. Circles. Buttons could be animated. They could be torches that are flickering. And then you turn, you, you turn one of them and then you start or you turn the other one and you go to help. Well, in order for any of these buttons to actually do anything, they're going to need to be symbols. To be turned into symbols. So that first one there on the left, I'm going to select that first button, F8, convert it to a symbol, clip, center rotation registration. Call this BTN start game. One button will be to start the game. The other button will be to get help. So this first button over here, converting to a symbol. The second button over here, Convert that to a symbol, ETN, get help. Again, I'm using prefixes. These things can be named anything. You know, get help could be the name of the button, but I'm using the prefix of BTN at the beginning because then when I'm looking at my code, my hundreds of lines of code, if the thing itself is named in a useful way, that's useful. 
And so I'm no, I know I'm going to interact with a button. So I have BTN at the beginning, and the button is called anything you want. Again, don't use spaces on these things. It's going to cause you more trouble. You can keep it all lowercase if you want, but using capital letters is nice for readability. That's looking like gibberish. Button, gevel, right? I can't really read that. But if I use a capital letter here and there, I can differentiate the words. Capitalization does matter when you write the code. So maybe keeping it all lowercase will be less effort to remember. This is more readable here. Traditionally, when you create names of objects, you do it in some way like this, that you have some sort of prefix in lowercase, and then the rest of the name of the object with some capitalization. Now, as we're, as we're doing on the, these lectures, of course, at any point, if anyone has any uh, needs any help, put your name in the chat, raise your hand if you're here, put your name in the chat, and obviously, if at any point you might have the question, well, why would we do it that way? Or what's the purpose of that? Of course, put it in the chat and I'll further explain. But the part about my code's not working. Okay, that we have to wait for the lab time and such. I can't pause the class and help catch someone up. Again, this is all being recorded. There should be no excuse to not get the code working. It's all being recorded. My example code will be on Canvas. You'll get help. There's no excuse to fall behind. So two movie clips, which exist in my library, which are infinitely editable. Whenever I want, I can go back to the library and go make changes, make them perfect circles, animate them so that they grow and shrink, change them completely so that they are little torches flickering. Again, we're gonna start very simple just to get it functional. If it functions, then I can go back and make that into a torch that flickers. I can turn that into a door that looks scary or another door that looks safe. But as long as it works, and what's going to matter about working is the code, as long as the code works, you can always go back and change those graphical assets. Got two objects on the screen. Very important here. I'll mention it a few times in the beginning, and then you have to memorize it. Anything that you need to interact with, either clicking on it, dragging it, anything you're going to interact with in however way of interaction must have an instance name. There's a name of the thing in the library where you can put 50 buttons on the screen based on one button. <clears throat> but then when it's on the stage, it needs an instance name. In the beginning, most people are going to make the mistake that they forget to put an instance name. And even though your code is perfect and you looked at it 50 times and it's perfect, you missed that. Computers are dumb. So instance name here. It can be the same name as in the library. I don't recommend it. But this needs a name. Call it... slightly different just to make sure you're paying attention uh the first button here to start the game i'm going to call this button start game no we'll call it will be even more tricky button game start i'm doing something on purpose here that is slightly tricky if you're not paying attention the name of the the name of the object in the library is one thing and it needs a name in the library, of course. But a little bit more important is that it needs an instance name so that the code can work. And that name can be anything, kitty cat. I'm going to change it differently here. Button, game start. I'm going to type it, press enter. Don't forget to press enter so that you lock it in. The second button, that's the one to go get help. Same thing, select it, instance name is missing. I will call that one button, help get. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what we'll call it. You might say, why don't we call it the same thing? You usually want to call the item in the library something very generic. It would be even more advanced to make one button called button, main button, let's say, and then put 20 copies of those buttons on the screen and change them all a little bit. 
And each of those instances has a name. That's how more of a professional way to do it. Why reuse, why make 20 different buttons if you can efficiently make one button and then just have instances of them on the screen and each one has an instance name. For the moment, we'll keep it simple. One button for each thing to click on, but make sure each one's got a name. Okay, I'm gonna start with the help button. The help button, we're gonna click it and it's going to go to our help screen. That means in the code. Right now I was I was uh, drawing those elements on one layer. Depending how complex you want to be, it's often a good idea to put each interactive element on its own layer. See about that a little later. But I drew some stuff in this background layer. I'm gonna lock the layer now. Then we'll go into our code layer. We'll do the right click, go to actions, go to the code. It's funny, I really wish they would have called this code. The language we're using is action script, sure, but it's code. I wish they would have called some of these things where it's actions. I wish I would have, they just called it code. But anyway, F9, right click, actions panel. I would suggest take a moment to Rearrange this panel a little bit so that you're comfortable with it. Put mine something like this. Stretch it out. I usually want to see more of it horizontally than vertically. Maybe move that left panel a little bit to give you more code space. And if the code is too small, remember, control, hold control on the keyboard and scroll wheel. So obviously in my example project, there's an example student that is working on this. Uh, oh, there. And the code we learned last week about stop the animation when the project uh, loads up. We have the multi-touch activated so we can actually interact with it. Got a trace message. We haven't done anything. I want to go to debug. I want to save. Save all or just save. And then debug. Debug your movie however you want, either on a device or on mobile simulator. I'll just go to the mobile simulator. It's faster. Simulator. I should not get any errors. Obviously, if we get errors, we want to fix that. But at least I want to see this so, so far. It should not be blinking. If it's blinking, something happened with the code. We haven't done any code yet, but it should not be blinking. And down on the output panel down here, the action script three is ready. It's just to get us back into the groove. We were here a whole week ago. Things can be forgotten easily, but this is just to get us back into the groove of this is our process. Write the code or edit the project, save the project, Run the project, running it in the debug screen. It's debugging, you can click the little X on the left side, debug console, back to editing. going to use like two codes over and over and over. Stop and trace, but we're going to use two more codes over and over. And what I kind of want to do is make a little sort of section of notes within our code. Um, because copy and paste is a very common and advanced method of coding. It's not that you need to type it over and over the same way. 
the, uh, save yourself some effort, copy and paste. So we're going to create a little section of reusable code. And oftentimes the code is going to be 99% the same. You just change one little thing about it. So instead of retyping it and typing it wrong, we can use our um, starting point examples. And the way we'll do this is we'll start a multi-line comment. So go to the final line here, 22 in my case, forward slash asterisk, press enter twice, asterisk slash. So in between here will be a bunch of comments. Tab it over if you want. Keep it on the left side if you want. I'm going to tab it over just because it looks, it stands out more to me. So we'll call this section of reusable code. Spell it right if you want. It's a comment. Here is code I'm going to use over and over. So first one here, event listener to detect when you tap or click something, an object. We're going to think in terms of objects. That button that I drew is an object to interact with. When the boss appears later on, that'll be an object. Even non-tangible things like a timer is an object. So not just you know physical things in the real world are objects. But in computer programming, object-oriented programming, which is what we're doing here, there's a thing we're interacting with, an object we're interacting with. And what I'm saying here, let's listen for the event. Let's pay attention to, let's wait for something to happen. Event listeners, we're going to do over and over. So we'll call this something dot add event listener. So make sure we spell this right. Listener, parentheses, semicolon. Okay, so very, very generically, we're going to be interacting with some object. Well, it might be even better to call this some object, if that helps you. Something we're going to intera interact with. What is the thing? Listen for an event. Listen for a tab a drag, a right click, a timer expiration, a high score reaching, something to wait for. In the parentheses, most often we will use this one. So we'll set it specifically, touch event, capital T, capital E, dot touch, underscore tap, all caps. This one is gonna change once or twice. Most of the time, there's something we're going to interact with. Most of the time, it's via tapping. Sometimes it'll be different, and that might change. I don't want to make it so generic because we're going to do that over and over. Might as well keep it consistent. This part over here, that's going to change over and over. You know, help button, start button, boss number one, mini boss two. All of these come from instance names. Maybe we should make a note of that. That well, what is that object? That is coming from the instance name, the interactive element. Let's say some object needs the instance name. Is it not done yet? Comma is going to run out with word wrap in a moment. In a case. The next up is then, call this, um, how should we call this? Custom code, custom function. Custom code makes sense for beginners, but custom function is a little bit more advanced. Let's do it that way, custom function. Okay, that's gonna change. So you see out of one, two, three, four, five things, Three will be the same over and over. Two will change. Custom function, some object. What is custom function? Means our specific, specific code to complete a task. 
lot about what programming is, is writing code to complete a task, either manually or automatically. The task I need to complete is to open the door on screen. That's a task. So there will be a code there that its task is to open the door. But not only opening the door, meaning the animation plays, but also there's a sound. And also I get points. And also I get experience or whatever. All of those things that you need to do when you accomplish a task are grouped together in what is known as a function. Say so a function is a collection of code. This line right here in our section of reusable code, we're going to use over and over. It's in a comment. This should be in a comment. It should be grayed out. If it's correct colors, you didn't put your comment correctly. If you're seeing colors there, that's wrong. It should be grayed out because ActionScript Animate is detecting that this is a comment here. Ignore it. It is a note for the programmer. It should not be real code. But it's here because we're going to do this over and over. So this generic code that I wrote here, I'm going to do what the purpose of this is. I'm going to select that one line. Mine is line 30. If your line numbers don't line up, that's fine. Don't worry about it at all. But if your line numbers line up with me, that's fine. In my line 30, I'm going to copy that one line completely and then paste it outside of the comment. Very important to make sure it's outside of the comment to block, outside of the ignored area, and it starts to get colorized. See some object in black, add event listener in blue, touch event in blue. Touch tap in black should be fine. And then custom function in black. It's not the right color. You might have misspelled it. Might have misspelled listener. Might have misspelled touch event. Point of this is a starting point that we will use over and over. We just need to fill in the specifics. Okay, the specifics, some object. That help button is what I want to interact with. That help button, I called it button get help on the instance name. So button get help. Copy and paste again, because you have to type it exactly the same as how you named it. Again, following me exactly will work most of the time. But if you ever change anything of your own stuff, which is perfectly fine, make sure that you type exactly what you typed on your file. Don't just robotically type what I type if you logically made a change. If you decided to call the button kitty cat, that's perfectly fine if it makes sense to you. If that has an instance name of kitty cat, then your code better have the spelling of kitty cat. And if you called it kitty with a capital K there and a lowercase there, but on the instance you put lower cases, that's wrong. Make sure, of course, it's exactly typed the same way as the instance name. If you're going to forget about uppercases and lowercase, keep it all lowercase. It's hard to read these words here. Okay, use underscores. This is too mechanical. I just call it button. Just call it help button. Yeah, call it whatever you want, but keep it consistent. Some object, okay, the help button, custom function, more code that will run after we interact with the button, a collection of our own original code. We'll call this one FN. I like to prefix the code again. This is going to reference to some code that is specifically a function, FN, where it is going to go to somewhere. How about go to a scene of help? We're going to invent our own code here about what is the meaning of go to a scene called help. There's no such code as that. We're going to invent it, our own custom function. 
we call it as we wish. Actually, I want to keep it even simpler, SC help. Didn't I call these things, in my case, SC title, SC help, SC main, SC end, SC whatever. However you want to call your scenes and however you want to refer to them. We'll see how those two tie in a moment. Why don't we just, why don't we just make it say SC help? That's what the scene is called. That's not the complete code. The complete code is wait to detect a button press, then run some code. And it may simply be, yeah, go there. But it's probably going to be go there, add experience points, update the on-screen map, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be 20 things, not just move to a new screen. So it's not that you type the name of the scene here and it just goes. No, we're setting ourselves up that it, um, that is um, set up for multiple Multiple, multiple code, play a sound, make an animation, then move to the next screen. Okay, I'm gonna jump back to my reusable code section. Say here, a generic function setup. We're gonna do functions over and over. We're going to make these custom functions over and over. When we detect this button, do that. When we press that, do something else. When, you, when we drag this, do something else. When we beat the boss, do something else. The something else is gonna be our custom function, our group of code, our collection of original code. And it's gonna be like this over and over. The keyword function, and then whatever the name of our function is gonna be, such as custom function, at the end of the line, colon void, curly braces. So every time we, we invent our own code, we always prefix it uh, or precede it with the special command function. It needs to have the parentheses. Notice I didn't put a space there, parentheses. Then we've got this colon. That's a colon, not a semicolon. Semicolon is very different. That means end of command. Command's not over yet. More stuff is here. No colon, uh, no semicolon. It's a colon. Void, don't worry about that. It just needs to be there. Space, curly braces. In between here, it's going to be 50 lines of code or one line of code. Even if you only need something to do one thing, you're still going to create this generic code skeleton for it to do the one thing. But the power of this is that we're set up so that then later, oh, actually, I need to do seven things, not just the one thing. Then at the end of the line there, you can add the semicolon. That's the end of the line, the end of the command. It's not done yet, though. Within those parentheses, event, lowercase, colon, touch event. Same way it was spelled up here. We're listening upon some object, specifically a touch event when we tap it, run some code. The definition of that code is here. Here's our explanation of what that original code is on the event of tapping happening somewhere. So here we can say function starts and to define my custom code. Then the name of my custom code. This part here about event, touch event. Uh, easy answer, just do it uh, or just use this. Just use it as is 99% of the time, 98% of the time. Most of the time, you're just going to do this. You don't have to memorize the why of it. It's just this almost always. 
on the event of there being some sort of touch, and then um, return a void, just that's how it's going to always be. And then the start and end of my custom code between these curly braces, right? Code one, code 99, between the curly braces. We're gonna do that over and over. So these are the two commands I meant we're gonna do over and over. Uh, yeah, we're gonna use this stop, that's automatic. We're gonna do tracing here and there, but we're going to have an event listener and the resultant function over and over. I know as a beginner that seems complicated, but you're gonna do it over and over. It's gonna make sense. And even if you never memorize it, that's why we're writing it here to just copy and paste it and change it when we need it. Oh, we need it here. So I'm gonna copy my line 37 and paste it down there. The color should change. Function is purple, void is purple, event touch is blue, custom function is black, and then the others are black. There's some button I'm gonna interact with. I'm gonna listen for interaction, specifically a touch interaction, specifically just a single tap. Do some code. What's the definition of that code? I got you right here. The definition of that code is the following. See the logic here. The definition of this custom code is the following. Play a sound, update my score, put a new dot on the completion map, um, move me to the new scene, play an animation, whatever we need it to do. Everything that we can do in the timeline, making it make a tween, make a fade in, we can do everything that we can do visually, we can do via code. Via code, I can drag a copy of a button onto the screen. We can do that via code. Well, if I have to drag seven copies of a thing manually here, we can do that via code. We can make it drag 700 copies of the one star that you drew in the library, make it drag a copy of 100 stars onto the screen and put them randomly on the screen. Whereas here, you know, I drag a copy here and then I put another copy there via code. Everything we can do visually, we can do through code. That's why it's amazing and difficult. And it has to be done perfectly or else the computer gets confused. Okay, hey, we're still building it up. Nothing is happening. We're still building up. We're not going to go this slow every time, but I'm going to go very slow in the beginning. Okay, what's next? Within these curly braces, this is where your specific code goes. And so for readability, I'm going to break apart those two lines to the next line. So let's go in between these curly braces here and press enter to break it apart. A couple of enters. Put that on the left if you want. Between here and here and here and here will be all the custom code until the end of that definition of my custom code. We teach programming. I would recommend at the end of your, your code here to write a little comment because as you write these dozens of lines of code over here and you have this one little straight code there, what does that mean? What did it connect to? What is it about? Well, that's where I have my comment, my single line comment of end of, however you want to spell it out, end of that code. This comment here is to remind me, there was a function that started somewhere up there 500 lines ago or two lines ago, but here's to note to me that this is the end of whatever this is connected to. Because of course I can scroll back when it's a short, app, but when it's a complicated app and you're going to waste time scrolling around, orienting yourself, I made myself a note that this is the ending of that code. It's optional. What's also optional that I recommend to do is to put a trace command as your first um, line of code here with the quote of 
the name of the function is running. As I said before, the, the error checker will tell you when you've got an error, but it won't tell you when you've got a success. And if I see this message, when I test my code, that means that I've written everything correct so far. Nothing's really happening yet, but things could go wrong. You could misspell so many things here. This trace is just to give ourselves a message that this is working so far, that I've drawn something on the screen, that I've given it an instance name, that I've typed all of this with proper caps, that I put a comma here, not a dot or something, that I defined my own custom code, that I explained what my custom code is, that I have all of this structure set up properly. Let's see if that works. Save. Debug. I'll do it in the simulator just to do it quickly. If I get an error, we'll fix it. No error. Down at the bottom, it should say the AS3 is ready. But if I want that message to appear when I interact with the button, I need to interact with the button. So turn on touch. Turn on relocate. Tap. Help is running. Help is running. If I'm clicking in and nothing happens in the console there, well, that's a that's a moment to stop and figure out and what's wrong with my code. If there's an error, it'll often tell you. Uh, if there's no error, it won't tell you. you know, I don't know if that's working or not. I didn't program it. That one, so far in my case, is working. Every time I tap it, it's working. Because my code is like this so far. A good point, too. That's a good moment to stop for questions and stop for the um, for the first break. All of this comment here is nice, but the part that matters right now are these lines right there. Questions at home, questions in person here. Does it kind of make a little sense? Is it way too weird? Is it logical, maybe? On a scale of one to 10, one is this is easy, 10 is this is impossible. Tell me in the chat what do you think so far? And then we'll take a break. It's 12.55, we'll take a break until 1.05. Then we'll continue. But at the very least, it's not gonna go to the other scene yet, but at the very least, you should see that message in your console and you should be used to saving your code, debugging your code, error checking your code, before we do the good stuff. So let's take a break at this point, back at 1.06, and then we'll go on.
All right, everyone, let's continue here. So at this point, the um, code that we're going to use over and over is there's some object with some event listener and then some result. Well, the, re the main result that I want is in this case, simply to move to another scene. That's the whole point of this setup. This long-winded setup is that I want to click a button and move on to the help screen, the scene that has the material of the help stuff. So that's something we're going to do over and over, actually, moving from screen to screen. So let me add a little bit more to my generic code section here. So let's do this on the generic function setup. Well, we're often going to do this part over and over. Uh, let's make a new section here. So we'll say to move from scene to scene. This is something we'll do over and over. And we need to maybe change a little piece of it, but over and over, it's gonna be very, very similar. We're gonna say movie clip, capital M, capital C, parentheses, dot go to, lowercase and uppercase, play, parentheses, that part's going to be the same over and over and over with some little details changed. But one more thing that's going to be the same thing over and over, this dot root. So this part right here is going to be the same over and over and over and over. The only thing that's going to change is the part in the parentheses over here where you tell it what frame number and then what um, scene name. I'll put it generically like this. No, actually, we'll put it like this. So frame number and then scene name. Be very specific. To break down what this is saying, well, all of this has to be basically always the same. Always the same. Nothing changes on that section. What's changing there, of course, frame no means what frame number? Usually, usually, um, you usually want the first frame of that scene. You can do some advanced things, however, to jump to different frame numbers. Uh, as we will get more advanced later, um, we can have a a scene. You can have one scene where between frames one and fifty is something happening. And then between 51 and 100, something else is happening. And you can have, depending on the person's experience points, for example, low experience, start them on frame one of my level one scene. But if they've already accumulated 50 experience points, okay, actually get them go to, to frame 51 of the level two. So usually one, but if you're doing advanced things, do that. And then, of course, scene name is the what scene to jump to. You need both. What scene am I jumping to? What frame number? You have to do it in this order that the first part of the command is the frame number and the second is the scene. I wish that they had invented it, that it was first the scene and then the number, because again, as a human, that makes sense to me. Go to that scene on that frame number. But no, we're dealing with dumb computers. So we have to say, go to frame number one, comma, of scene two, of scene 20. That's the generic code. That I'm gonna copy and paste it where it needs to be. And of then of course change the little bit that needs to be changed. So that one line we just wrote there, we will confirm if you wrote it right when you paste it in here and the colors turn correct. Movie clip, capital M, capital C is blue, this, is purple, root is blue, go to and play is blue, and then black. And yeah, the spelling here is very specific. We're not choosing to call this go to and play. There's no such thing as go to and play, but there is such thing as go to and play, spelled in a very specific way. Why? Because when action script code was invented, that's how they decided. That's when they decided movie clip, capital M and C, and all that other stuff. So some of these things that are just built in, usually the things that are color-coded, the things that are color-coded are often the things that are built in and have to be typed in a very specific way. 
And the things that are black, usually we invent and we can type them how we wish. Hey, maybe that's a note to write there. Code that is in color is usually built in code. Almost always, there's probably a couple. Code that is color is always built in. Code that is black is usually our original code. Touch tap is not our original code, but it's one of the ones that's built in. I don't know why that's an exception. That our colors are all built in. These that are black, we invented. Code that is gray, I guess you can write that too. Code that is gray is ignored. Comment. So what do we need to change? Go to frame one of my scene called, in my case, in the case of this project, scene help. Okay, so spelled exactly as I called it up there, SC help, and in quotation marks. Probably want to say up here, scene you want to jump to in quotes. The number is not in quotation marks. It's just written as a number. And then the quotes is the name of my scene. That's a thing people will miss as a beginner. That looks like it makes sense, but it's wrong because technically it might think you're running a function inside of a function, so a subcode inside of a code, but we're not doing that. What's the difference? Is it complicated? Yes, but you just, this is one of the things to memorize. Maybe we should put it also up here that your scene name should be quoted. So frame number, no quotes. Scene name quoted. Then I also noted in quotes here. In real code, in quotes. Text that is in green. So color is built in. Green is a special case. What's the generic definition of that? Green that is code that is green means so it's a comment on 53 but it's also an instance name on 54 so code that is green means original i guess we'll keep it easy uh code that is green means instance name well not even instance name because it's the name of the scene so original entity which again as a beginner that doesn't make sense but maybe i can think of a more simpler term, but original, um, original uh, entity name. Original, original, original entity name. What does that mean? Uh, it's green, just go with it. So now I can try to test this. Something to be clicked on, run code. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Make a message in the console, in the feedback box, and then move us to a new screen. Let's see if you're able to debug. If not, we'll figure it out. But if you're able to debug, let's see. I'm going to debug there. I got no error messages. I'm in my simulator. I need to turn on touch. I need to relocate. And I need to click help. Oops, my app is dead. No, it, it worked. I went to my scene of help, but there's nothing there on screen. But it went there. I didn't get any error here. My messages are saying you clicked on the go to help. But of course, there's nothing here to interact with, so I'm stuck, which, of course, I have not finished it yet but this is to take us to that help screen. Your device, please, Gil. 
Remember, mute your device when you come into class, everyone. But it should be muted because it's distracting, as I've said before. So this is my code so far here. And we're going to do something like this over and over. We need to do this for this uh, start the game button. We'll do that in a moment. But the point here is now I can click help and it goes to my help screen, which is nothing here. So I'm going to continue here uh, for the moment. This is all that I want on this screen. Yeah, we can do this one in a moment, uh, but I want to deal with what's happening with help here. So if the code worked, I'll proceed. If it didn't, we'll do some help a little bit later. Uh, but again, this is all being recorded. I'm gonna upload my example code to Canvas. You'll be able to get help, but let me move on here. In the help screen, nothing is here. Oh, there's something here. Fill in the rest later. But in my help scene, in my code of my help scene, this is something to, to learn here that on the left side tree over here, your scene of title has a layer called whatever, like AS. And on frame one of that layer, you have code. In your help scene, you have a layer called whatever, such as AS. And on that frame one, you've got code. So I already did this for everyone that on the particular scenes here, we've got stops. There's a way to jump around instead of clicking on the scene panel. But when we get to this particular scene of help, it just stops, but why not give ourselves a little trace here? You are now in the help screen. But even if I didn't have anything visually on screen, in the console, I keep calling it console because other apps call it the console, but here they call it the output panel. So if I miss, if I misname that, sorry, when I just remember that, when I say in the console, I mean the output panel. But whenever you see that message in your output panel, even if you don't have anything visual here, that would be enough to tell you, oh, I've moved to the right screen. So if I save it, debug it, remember keyboard shortcut, control shift, enter on the keyboard if you want to save some time. That help. Yeah, that's on screen, but down on the console, the very first code that started when my app started, code is ready. Then when I click the button, that button is, is, is currently running, it's active. You're, you're interacting with that button. Then when it moves to the next scene, you are now in the help scene screen. That's, that's the feedback that I'm giving myself when ActionScript, when Adobe doesn't, right? That message of this code is currently running. Run that code, but we don't get any feedback. We program the feedback on scene two, help scene, you're here now. Optional, but useful. Go back to scene one for a moment. Yeah, I'll generically call these sometimes scene one, scene two, scene three. Should not do that. I should call them by what they're named, but it'd be useful uh, to go back to the code here. And how about more comments? Do this. Give yourself a message that it's running. And then how about this one? Move us to move the player to the help screen. You know, this is all optional, but I highly recommend you comment your code. Uh, if you're following along and such, it's better to type the code that matters. All of this code that's commenting, I don't wanna say it doesn't matter, but if you're choosing between following along and writing everything, choose to write the code that matters. This comment stuff, again, it's comments. It can be misspelled, it can be ignored. On your own time, you could make your own comments as you wish, but sometimes I'll throw comments in here to further explain the code. It's being very redundant because I explained it up here, but 
as a beginner, we might as well be redundant. Then as you get more advanced, you can do shortcuts. The full explanation of what's happening there. And now on the help screen, I drew some quick help. Later, I'm going to make an animation here and a cut scene and, the, and my character will appear and one of those model sheets that I drew, he'll be there and my character will talk and interact with the other protagonist and tell me what the story is. Yeah, we'll do that later. Right now, we're just dealing with the basic stuff and then the icing on the cake will be added later. Well, the main thing here is, okay, I read the help screen. Now what? Well, now I need to go back. I need some sort of interactive element to interact with so that the code takes me back to the previous screen. All right, I have several options. I could use one of my built-in buttons that I've made so far. I can make a new button. It can be a static button like we have now or a little animated button. The sky is the limit. I'm going to take one of my buttons. You know, you might have made one like me that I called the button literally help. Obviously, if I put the help button here, that doesn't make sense. I'm already in help. If I try to change it, it'll change the original button. In my case, I left a button that was kind of generic. In the library, it's called start game. But it doesn't matter what it's called in the library. It matters what the instance name is on the stage. In my case, I'm just going to grab a copy of one of my buttons from the library, plop it onto the stage, maybe change it somehow, rotate it, change the color, whatever. This is one of the cool things you can do with these instances, the original versus a copy of it. I've got a copy of the button. It's on the background layer. I need an instance name. This is where people will make mistakes. Get into the habit of putting your instance from the library onto the stage and then right away giving it an instance name. That's where people are going to make the mistake. TN, go back. Whatever it's called in the library doesn't matter. This instance name matters. We're inventing our own unique entity name center. So now that button has, that object has an instance name. Lock that layer, go back to your code layer. We should have our visual elements on one or 100 layers, and we should have our code on one layer. And every scene usually has its own code layer. And for the moment, think about it, that if I need some code to happen, I should put it in that scene. Technically, you can write all your code on one scene, and it'll work on the whole game. That's kind of advanced as beginners. Wherever I have a scene, I will write the code for that scene. As a beginner, let's do it that way. So in this particular scene, the only code that I've got here is that stop plus the trace. So in this scene, I need to write the code to make that button to make that button clickable, and then I write need to write the code about um, what happens after I click it. So it's going to be again the event listener code and that function code. So. Copy and paste, as I said, the whole point of making this section over here of generic code, I've got the code that is about interacting and how am I interacting. So I'm going to go back to my scene one. Again, this side panel is going to be very valuable to quickly jump through your code. So I need this listener. On my new help scene. And I need the custom function code back on my reusable section. What I need there is the move me to some screen.
So logically, I need to change a few things. What's the object that I'm interacting with in this screen? What is the custom code that's going to happen in this screen? What is the definition of that custom code? And then the specific stuff here. So in this scene, I called this button. I already forgot, but I called it. BTN, go back. Copy there. So in this scene, there's a button there that I called something. BTN, go back. That is going to run some amount of code. How about FN back to main, back to title, whatever we want to call it. This code that is about to happen is being defined right here. Copy and paste. Curly braces here, just as before. Break them apart, enter. Maybe note to yourself and FN back. If you want to type it right, trace it. Again, this is some generic stuff that we will do over and over. If you'll start to love or hate. Code that matters is that, which has to run after we detect a click to take us back to frame one of our scene called title. Instead of me typing all that manually, copy and paste, change, change the one, two, three, four things that need to be changed instead of the 18 things. Right. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. 11 things that don't need to be changed, four things that do. One, two, Three, four. Of course, these things need to be spelled properly. If that scene is called scene title and you called it scene title, then that's wrong. If you called that scene title, but it's called scene title, that's wrong. If you called it scene title, but then you called it scene title, that's wrong to be exactly the same. Computers are dumb. Save it, debug it. Touch, relocate, go to help, help. Go to back, back, help, back, help, back. My output down there is telling me that. You've gone forward, you've gone back, code is ready, this is running, you're here, you're there. Switches, of course, are going to happen if mine doesn't. So it means I've had years of practice. If you keep getting errors every time you try, we'll help you. Most of the time it's going to be the errors here. Sometimes you might have some weird little error here and there, but still we'll help you with it. Especially if here in person, it's the easiest way. But at this point, one screen, I move back to another screen. There's nothing interesting here yet. That'll be for later. At the very least, I'm getting the basics set up, the code basics. And then I can spend all the time I want getting the icing on the cake, the animation, the, the camera movement, the um, glow effect, the tween, the cut scene that happens. Because eventually what I do want to do is uh, when I move from a screen to a screen, well, I want my character to appear for a moment first, right? I want my, my character to appear first and say something, and then I want the screen to be visible. You can do that later. I want the basic code to run first. I want that mostly when we do when we go from screen to screen, an interactive screen that is the main game screen, I want my character to appear. Say, "Oh, here it looks like I'm in front of this front, in front of this scary uh, mansion. I wonder what I do. Let me see about that rock over there. You know, how generic or how uh, how much of an ex exposition I want to give. My character appears first, talks a little bit, and then I interact. We can do that later.
this is the help screen. Back on the title screen, well, that button to go to uh, level one or screen one of my project. In my case, I called it main one. I'm gonna change those names. Before I get into the mansion, the very first screen I'm gonna see is a gate or front door or the curb or whatever. I wanna, before I get into the house, into the property, there's gonna be first a simple interactive screen of let's open the door. The next screens are gonna be more complex. Well, what if I try this? keyhole here? What about if I try the window over here, or climb the tree? But here's where I'm going to deviate a little bit. Again, these names of things should make sense to you mostly. You're writing the code, it's your project, but they should make sense also in terms of uh, concepts. So I don't like it anymore that it's main one, main two. We're going to change the name of these two scenes. Scene gate, scene front door. Change the name of a scene. We'll go up to the window. Let's go to window. Let's go to scene. For the starting names. When you set up your own project, I have, you know, they're due tomorrow. But when you set up your own project, you can name your scenes however you want. You're not being required to name them like I have it. If you don't like this SC part at the beginning, Name them how you want. For the lecture here, uh, scene title, scene help. Okay, this one I'm going to now change to scene gate. Scene uh, front door. There will be a scene where there is a simple gate to interact with, and then a scene for the front door. Right, so in my project so far, I've written lots of comments back on scene one. Not too much actual interactivity. Scene one, we've got a little bit of interactivity. Scene two, help. It's just the go back. Back on scene one, well, we've got that other button to take us to the gate scene. Before we go to the gate scene, I'm going to add that trace on my gate scene. Now at scene gate. If I see that message in the in the output, even if I don't have anything on screen, if I see that message on the output, that's a good indicator that I properly went from scene to scene. So again, this is happening in the gate scene, previously main one. Don't leave it generically main one. Be specific on your code, generic code, if you're advanced, is good. But as a beginner, I'm going to teach it as be very specific. So we have copy and paste. Later on, hey, this makes sense. Later on, I'm going to do front gate, now at the front gate. Seen good, now it's seen good. Bad scene, trace, now it's seen bad, later. For the moment, title scene, I need this button to do something. So make sure you've got an instance name. Button in the code, I need this chunk for the other button. Okay, so I need the center code. Function definition code. Specifically in this case, I'm just still just doing a move around. Need the move around code. Filling in the details. What am I interacting with? The button on the left, which I called button game start.
button game start. Some code, how about a function to go to main one? Again, that scene could be called anything you want. The code, as long as it's logical, can be anything you want. This here doesn't need to be the name of the scene. What matters about the name of the scene is eventually the go to that scene. There's a little trap I'm putting in here in the code. I'll put traps in my code once in a while just to make sure you're not just turning my code in when you do the assignment. In one. Frame one, scene, gate. This has to happen when this runs after we interact with this. So again, break those curly braces apart. Note to yourself, this is the end of that code. Base that this command is happening. And then the move us to where we need to go to must be in between those curly braces. If this is starting to make sense, that's great. Here we're going to do this over and over. Something to interact with somehow. Run my code. Here's my code. Do this. Save it, always remember to save. And if I debug it, I see my ready, activate touch, help works. I know I knew it worked a moment ago. Back in, oh, let's see if my new start the game works. Nothing on screen, I haven't drawn anything, but my console says now I'm at the gate. My go-to main one is running, and now I'm at the gate. When that code worked, I then went to the gate. I wanted a third button to go somewhere else. I would do the exact same thing over and over where I would make a brand new button. Give it an instance name, give it a listener, give it a function definition, and then write the code that I need. These buttons right here are obviously visible, but this interaction can work with invisible buttons because we have the ability to change the alpha onto symbols. What if I had a button on the screen that had a color effect alpha of zero? This is take thinking on the next level. There's a button there, but it's invisible. But if it has an instance name, it's interactive. This is how I can create Easter eggs and such. This is how I can do the alternate secret paths in my game. There's the, uh, there's the obvious things to interact with, and then there's the secret things. Now, obviously, in, in real video games, when something is, is secret, you know, if this wall over here, if, if the wall was wood here, and then the wall over here is brick. You might say, is there something here? Can I interact with that brick? Yes, it's a passageway. Well, here, what if I have that very, 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 very lightly faded out like that? Like if you're really, really looking, oh, there's something in the corner there. Alpha can be fully 100, 
and interactive. Alpha can, can be fully zero and interactive as long as as an instance name and then the pair of code here about um, pay attention to something and then do something after clicking. So something to think about for like Easter eggs and secret passageways. After I click start the game in the scene one, the gate, some interactive elements on screen. So on the main background layer, okay, uh, we're gonna think a little bit of a, a head because I know what we need to do and we should do it right before wasting time. Uh, we've been using one layer here. We are gonna separate a few things here. There's gonna be a layer for just the background of the of the wall, and then another layer for the for the gate itself. Just to let you know that's gonna be easier in the long term. And you should always consider things that I'm gonna interact with should be on their own layer. So I'm just gonna call this layer wall, and then a layer gate. And then of course I'm gonna draw a simple wall on the wall layer, and then a gate on the gate layer. We'll turn that gate into a symbol. Then we'll write some code for it. We're going to do that dance over and over. Some interactive element on its own layer turned into a symbol, code connected to it. We're going to do that over and over. Think about the real games that you play. This is a real game, but I mean, think about the big games that you play. There's interactive elements, and behind the scenes, there's code attached to it. We're doing exactly what the we're doing exactly what Nintendo or Sony or Microsoft would be doing. We're writing code, we're creating graphical elements, we're connecting them, interactivity. It's a game. A layer. Let's see. Um let's say we're gonna have a path. It'll be a wall here. Spiky wall. They can polish it all up later. Just need to see something. Again, we're doing the haunted house together. You're going to be doing your own adventure thing. So you should be following the haunted house example in the lecture and then on your own you're going to do all of this on your own project but um oh also uh, don't be afraid to when you draw this stuff go outside of your main stage a little bit because we never really know on what size games will will run on and on some people's screens if you draw your drawings exactly to the edge, it'll there'll be a little bit of empty space on the edges. It is a little better to go slightly out of the edge a little bit so that it reaches the edge of everyone's devices. So always think about that, just going slightly further if you need something to be visible on the most devices, it's good to go slightly outside of the boundaries. We've got a gate on it. Oh, we got a wall on its own layer. Um, anything that's interactive, I would recommend put it on its own layer. Let's say one of these spikes over here is a secret passageway to go through. Yeah, you should put it on its own layer and then write the code for it. I'm not going to get too complex yet. There's going to be one gate here, which will be interactive. And uh, we're also going to throw in here about uh, animation, uh, animation through code. But before that. Uh, so on the gate layer, I'm going to draw a gate here. It's on its own layer, right? It's on its own layer. So if I drew, if I draw a gate right here, the gate is not complete because on the wall layer is that line that I think is complete, but it's not complete. Complete the gate here. So 
I want to draw one of those things that you, it's got a ball and then you pull it, something like that. So a little circle ball here and then here. And then we've got mm -hmm. the, there, sure. So there's going to be a gate here. I'll, fi I'll figure out and polish all the details later. But the wall on its own layer and then the gate on its own layer. Even though I see a gate, animate only sees one, two, three, four, five lines. It doesn't see a gate, meaning, you know, this part of the wood here, there's nothing there. Obviously, everything that's gray, there's nothing there. So I've only drawn these lines. If someone's trying to tap, they have to tap exactly where there's a line. This is empty. This is empty. This is empty. This is empty. So be careful here. Just because I've drawn a gate, it's not a gate, it's lines. So I'm going to fill in some basic colors, which I can change whenever. I don't fill in this color right here and someone taps right there. If their finger taps the empty part, it's not tappable. Wherever there is color, is interactive, is clickable, but where there is no color there, is not interactive. Skate. Anything that I need to interact with has to be upgraded from a basic shapes and lines, it needs to be upgraded to a symbol. Everything that's interactive needs to be a symbol, just like the two buttons back on the first scene. Okay, so this gate that I drew here, to right-click, convert to symbol. Ninety-nine percent of the time, we're working with a movie clip. Registration in the center with some name. Gate would be a fine name, but if you're going to have multiple gates on multiple screens and such. Um, the names of these could help you when you're dealing with 20 of them. So we'll call this um, this gate front. Say so, uh, gate. We'll just call it gate zero one for the moment. So the symbol this is the symbol, not the instance name. I'm converting to a symbol. I'm putting it into the library, gate one. You can call this, you know, brown gate, front gate, etc. Gate one. This is now an independent object. It's in the library. Hey, how about I have multiple gates to walk into and one of them will kill you and one of them will give you the treasure and one of them doesn't open. Just keep it simple. One gate here. Uh, the point of our game also is that it's going to kind of teach you as it progresses itself. There's going to be some screens where it's going to be one basic thing to interact with. There's going to be other screens where there's three things to interact with. There's going to be screens where the interaction is a single click. There's other screens that it's going to be a drag. Pull down the cable to open the gate. There's going to be others where you get this key and put it into this keyhole. There's going to be interaction of pick this up into my inventory to use it later. So each screen will be slightly different forms of interaction. And again, thinking about the next level of things. Right now, this is just going to appear here. What if I have a camera movement to first move here? What about a camera movement that kind of moves to different parts of the scene first? What about I have my character appear first and say, okay, here I am on my adventure. I got to get into this scary place. Let me go up to the front door and see what happens. Then that character cutscene goes away. And then I see that and now I interact. But if you make the character say, yeah, I need to get in here. I, hope, I better not get near those scary spikes. What about if you're giving the player some subtle or not subtle plot? or hints on gameplay. Of course, you can trick them if you'd say, I should not touch those spikes. 
Some people will say, yeah, I don't want to touch those spikes. Other people will say, what if I touch those spikes? It's still up to the player to decide how they play your game. Store, I want it, of course, to be interactive. Click on it, go to the next scene. I want to add a little bit more, however, here compared to the first button. I want, when I click the door, make the door open. I don't just want to move to the next scene. I want the door to open up first and then to the next scene. So before I make it interactive, I want to set up my animation here for this door. And this door, which is a symbol, some animation built into this door. I can either double click it in the library and then I start to animate the door here. Or if I double click it from, uh, if I double click it from the stage, you will then see a faded out view of the rest of the scene. That might be useful there because you can see based on what else is on the scene, how it how it relates. If you only edit it from the library, you will only focus on that one object and you don't see how it relates to everything else on the scene. This may be the way that makes sense for you. So yeah, do it. To me, it makes more sense that I want to see the thing in the scene. So with with it on the scene, I will double click it so I can see the rest. I can't interact with anything else because I'm in the object of the gate, which is in that scene. But to me, I like it better that way. And what I want to do here is um, make a simple animation of the door opening. So many ways, of course, with some tweens, because it's going to kind of, you know, rotate open with some frame-by-frame -frame animation, lots of ways. Um, I'm going to do this frame-by-frame. Frame. I kind of like frame-by-frame. Frame. You get more control. Uh, we'll do it frame-by-frame frame for the moment. So that means I got frame one. We'll go back to our roots of animation. We'll do every two frames. We'll make an animation. Uh, we'll make a, a new frame with F7. So we're on frame one. We'll go to frame three, F7. I want to draw the next part of the door opening. Maybe you can turn on onion skinning. Previous frame. And I want to start to draw the door opening up here. Here's the edge of the door right there. Draw all the details later. But on frame one, it's there. On frame three, it's starting to open. Probably need the rest of the door here, which will be dark. Come two more frames, F7, onion skin, so I can see that. Make the door even more here. This. Jump two more frames, F7. Fully opened over here, sure. Here's the back of the door, I guess. Here's the hollow of the door. Five. So very simple animation here. Door is open. I can I could labor over this for an hour later. I just want quick door open. F7 to create a new blank frame, draw a little bit open. Jump two frames, F7, draw a little bit more open. Don't stress at the moment, just right here, what is this, eight frames. Opening. I'm not even going to color in the colors. I'll do that later. Just want super simple animation, door opens. So we've learned previously that in a symbol, you can make an animation. We're doing that again. We learned that back on part one. Now we've got that when we see our project 
and we go to that scene. I'm in my gate scene and it's playing my animation nonstop. These computers are dumb. Didn't I put a stop command here so that when I get here, it stops? Yes, we put a stop on this scene, but we didn't put a stop on this door. So the door animation is gonna play infinitely here. I don't want it to animate open until I interact with it. This is just doing what it wants because we didn't program it to do what we want. What we want is when we get to this scene, this door animation should be stopped on this frame. So yeah, there's a lot of confusing stuff here and that's just how it is. This is an, adv this is an advanced class doing an advanced topic, but little by little, it'll make sense. And what needs to make sense here is we need code in this object, in this movie, so that this door doesn't automatically play. This door has an animation, has its own timeline. Every timeline is independent. Every timeline that we need to care about needs to have code. So in the timeline of the gate, I need a layer here for code. And frame one, of my um, frame one of my code layer, my action strip layer, inside of my gate object, I have good old stop. And once you type that, you should see here, there's a scene with code. There's a symbol with code. So this side panel over here is very useful. It's a stop symbol of the gate. If I view this project in the simulator, I go to the gate. Gate should not be automatically opening and closing like it was possessed. Because I stopped the animation of the, stopped the animation of the, um, of the door. That symbol has its own timeline. It had an animation. I don't want the animation to play until I reach out to open it. Therefore, that object has a stop side of its animation. We have code to stop an animation. We have code to play an animation, rewind an animation, jump to different parts of the animation. What I want is that when this gets clicked, play the animation of the door, opens the door, and then walk in to the next scene. The next scene will be front door. We're out on the gate. We need to get past the gate into the front door. This will be the, the last thing we do for today. Then we'll get to some lab time, make sure everyone's on track. But, okay, I need that door to be interactive. I give it an instance name. Nope, not yet. As I said, I was gonna forget myself. But whenever we have an object, we want to give it an instance name right away so they don't forget this step. Call this one BTN. Uh, gate wall. Wall gate. Logic of it. This is a button I'm interacting with. It is on the first wall, and it's a gate. It's on the first wall, and it's a gate. Whatever I want to call these things inside of the... Um, library, this is gate one, gate version one, brown gate, whatever. And then I put copies of that gate throughout my whole game. And then each individual copy has its own unique name. Every object must have its own unique name. The code will get confused. 
you have 10 things with the same name, it doesn't know which one you're trying to click on because they'll have the same name. So this has a unique name. Interact with it. Okay. We've done three, we've done three interactive, we've done three interactivities so far. The two buttons on the first scene, the one button on the second scene. Now in the third scene, I need that gate to be interactive. Okay. Here's the rep here's a repetitive part of coding. The copy and paste. This is happening on the on the scene of the gate, not in the gate, but the scene. Then I copy again the function. Which is then going to have the move us somewhere. Okay, which is going to have the move us somewhere. The things I need to change here, one, two, three, four. So the gate on screen here, I called BTN wall zero one gate. Some custom code will activate here. Uh, trust me on this one for the moment. Fn play gate and animation, and then the definition here. Function play gate animation. As usual, break these curly braces. Note that it is the end. This is currently running. This is the code we need here, logically. After we interact with the um, after we interact with the gate, it's going to take us to the first frame of what's the next scene. Scene uh, four, which is front door. That's very familiar. Now we've got the fourth instance of a little chunk of code that we've already done three times. As I said, we're going to do something like this many times with a basic interaction. The more advanced interactions of put this into my inventory, we'll get to that about the multiple paths. We'll get to that. There's no homework this week. It's just about practicing the code so far. Yeah, yeah, I can see after the class, yeah. Uh, week four, there's no homework on week four, but on week three, uh, we're. Yeah, that one's due tomorrow. So yeah, I can check it later on. So here so far, what we've got is that uh, so there's some interaction and that seems to make sense. It worked previously, so let me try it. And I've got to make sure all my instance names are correct. That's always going to cause us problems. If you didn't put an instance name, if you mistyped it, if you reused the same instance name, those could cause problems. Let's see how mine is working here. So I go to the gate. I see the gate right here. The gate should not be flapping around. It has its own stop command. And when I interact with that gate, my code down here says gate is gate animation is running. I didn't write any code on my front door to say I am at the front door. Forgot to do that, but I'm at the front door. There's nothing there, but I'm there. And okay, it did what I wanted, but it didn't, I didn't see playing the animation of the door. The whole point of making a cool little animation of the door is that we see the door swing open and then walk in. 
doing this right here skipped all of that and it just took us there. Dumb computer. I wanted the door to play first. So this was a trick question. This works, but this doesn't care about the door. So we're going to do this. That code will matter in a moment. I'm going to comment it out. Before we move to that other screen, we want to play the door. So maybe a note here. Before we move to the next scene, play the animation of the door. The door animation is currently set to stop. Well, if we have a stop command, it's the opposite of stop, go, sure. But play is the opposite in action script. Stop, stops in animation, play, plays in animation. Um, so this gate, of that gate dot play here at the very beginning the very first line is saying on this scene stop everything here stop here so we can interact um once we've interacted with the door play the animation of the door that's how this is written there's some object and we're attaching with that dot, we're attaching the command to play. So this would make sense if I went like that. Okay, there's that wall, play it. That kind of makes sense. That's wrong because we're saying we have to do it in the way, in the syntax, in the way the language was invented. The name of the object, the instance name, and then play that animation. So we can kind of say generically object or instance name dot play to play a paused or stopped symbol. Generically, there's some instance name and then always play. So that, if I interact here, Gate, press the gate, gate opened, press it again, gate opened. It's not going to the next place yet. Computers are dumb, but it's doing what I told it. Every time you click it, play the play dot play the animation of the door. Cool. It's not complete yet. Getting there, but you see how this is like. Lego building blocks, little by little, you get to a cool result I'm getting there. So what I want is, okay, play the animation and then go to a place. Now it might make sense. Okay, well, I just need to turn this code back on, play the animation and then move. That makes sense, but that won't work because code basically runs at the speed of light. And basically when, when the app starts, it processes all the code. Uh, and there might be something you interact with, but let's say you press the gate, so it'll do this play and then it'll go there. We are not going to see the gate open up and then go to the next screen. It's going to start to play the, the animation and then move. Well, I've got four frames, but what if I've got 40 frames of, it, of smooth animation? I want those 40 frames to play and then to move. There's many ways to do this, but what I'm going to do is here inside the inside the inside the gate inside the gate object move us to front door is let me come back to the, that one moment what that means is i have this animation here that i want to play when i know it finished playing make code here to jump us to the front door. So wait for interactivity. Once I pressed, once I pressed the gate, play this timeline. 
once it opens up, then from here, at the end of this animation, then jump us to the next scene. So the next level of complexity is that we can have, okay, code on scenes, code in objects, code in specific parts of a timeline. I need animation to first happen before code is triggered. This one is code is happening as soon as this part of the game starts, but I want code to happen after something happens. So that's what I'm trying to say over here. That's what I'm trying to say over here. Inside the, uh, the gate, move us. So this code that was here, I'm gonna cut it. You can copy and paste or I'm gonna cut it. I don't need it there. I need it to happen after the gate plays, after the gate plays is inside the symbol, but obviously not, not there. It's after the gate plays, after frame in my case, in my case frame seven or eight or whatever. But again, thinking of when, when you all did the part one class and I said, uh, you need more time on that, more pause on that. You need this to be more visible until the next thing. Well, I don't want it to, quickly play that and then move. I want it after some amount of time, like maybe after almost two seconds, you know, it opens up and then it pauses for a moment because we can then see it opened up and then we can go through. So after, I don't know, 40 frames, seven on the code layer, after these frames, pause, frame 40, F7, on frame 40, is my code to move us to the front door. The symbol has code at the beginning of its animation and at the end of its animation. The code at the beginning of the door animation is stop, don't do anything more, wait for something else to happen. After the something else happens, animation plays, the timeline will move from frame two to frame 40. When it hits frame 40, move us to the front door. See, so title, I click start the game. I'm at the gate. Gate should not be animating. When I click the gate, animates to open, little bit of a pause moves to frame to scene four or scene five or whatever we are on front door my code down here is saying that we're ready at the start of the game you click the button to go to your main scene now i'm at the gate i click the button to play the animation of the door i didn't write any more code for feedback i should have but then that played the animation and then Where I needed to, to the front door. We'll pick it up there next time, but this is what's happening here. Uh, the interactivity happening on the gate, the code that is uh, stop when we get to the gate, message to myself. There's an interactive element once we tap it, run some code. Definition of that code is here. Give myself some feedback. Play the animation of that paused symbol. Once that starts playing after frame one, we get to frame 40 of the gate, then move us to the front door. We're at the front door. I've been testing it on the simulator. Let me see this working on my real device. So debug on to my plugged in device. 
I've been doing it on the simulator because it's faster, especially the first time that you do this on a real device. It takes a moment to process it all and then put it onto the device. And when I when it pops up here also, allow debugging, allow connection, I would click remember, do that. And eventually this will work. The first time you publish to your device, it takes the longest, but subsequent ones are a little faster, but still slow. It's just the nature of it. It doesn't matter how fast your computer is, it's other stuff. And eventually, okay, you get this message here, ignore it, you just click okay. And then this loads up right here. And if you see me there at home or here in person, the game is running on my real device. If I tap on help right here, it's going to go to my help screen right there. And then if I tap on the back, it goes back. And then when I go to the gate front door, start the game, I'm at the front door. My feedback is happening down there on the output console. Animation of the door is paused. Later on, icing on the cake, these clouds are going to move. I'm going to hear birds chirping, whatever. Ominous music. That door should not be flapping until I tap it, opens up, cool, pause, move to the next scene. My output there says I'm on the front door. I'll draw a front door later. But everything that I did on the simulator, I'm doing on a real device. Um, on the real device, it's very impressive because it's on a real device. If you... Um, if, if on the real device, you also go to your app screen, right? There's Chrome, there's Maps, whatever. If you go to all apps, you're going to see there your app there as well. This is right here, 2024, 624. You know, the name that I gave it over here, that I gave it over here under the Android settings, which don't matter at the moment, but my app is installed right there. Even though I've exited debugging now, I can tap it right there. It's it's an app that's installed on this Android device. Here it is right there. Real game running on this. Obviously, there's a lot to do. Animation and game. I mean, animation and movie and write your plot and all that stuff, but we've got, we're on week four out of nine, we're less than halfway. We've got lots to learn. This is so far on my notes here. This is like line uh, somewhere around 80 or so. We've, we've written lots of comments. Um, we've written lots of comments in our code to explain ourselves, but kind of a, just very little actual code, right? Because I've got this huge chunk of explanation. But the actual codes, you know, there were three there already for you. And then I wrote one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight lines of code in frame in scene one. On scene two, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. In the gate, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Inside of the gate itself, there's one and two. If you add all of that up, you still have hundreds of lines to do. That either sounds exciting because there's a lot to learn or that sounds daunting because there's a lot to do. But that's the nature of a game. A full game from the big companies, millions of lines of code. Our game, tiny, 500 lines. But when it's all together and it's your idea working on a real phone and with your music and your animation and your characters, that's way better than anything from Nintendo, or Microsoft or Sony. It's your game. So with that hype, we will end at this point. Here's how things are going to work. All of this example stuff, I'm going to save it. I'm going to upload it to Canvas. Everything that I've done right now, I'll put it right there in Canvas live session. All of this that's being recorded, I'm going to put it right there in Canvas. You'll be able to play, pause the recording however you want. If I went too fast, play the recording, pause it. If you want to see my example code, I'm going to put all my code. You see it works. Yes, you could copy and paste all my code and turn it back into me when the assignment is due, and I'll never know, except for you and maybe someone else. So as long as you get your code working uh, and you're comfortable with how you got it working, it works. And if you get a good grade, amazing. But we're here to help. We're going to start lab a little early. If you're going to stay until 3, you need to sign in on the computer back there. If you're there at home, ask for help on the chat. Uh, but we'll end for today. 
general questions. So no homework this week, just practice all of this. Lots of steps, lots of details, practice this. Last week's assignment is due tomorrow. So maybe now that we've seen a little bit ahead, maybe you can think a little bit more about that before you turn it in. What I've seen turned in looks good so far, but it's due tomorrow. No homework this week, but just practice time. Next week, more code that we will learn that you then will apply to your project. There'll be a homework in two weeks, but no homework this week. Week four out of nine.